And I think we're in a very good place. I think we're, we're about ready to go. So again, I'll say uh, briefly, my name is September Kruger. I'm director of Lifelong Learning with the Cameron Art Museum. I'm excited to welcome everyone here this evening for our conversation with Diana Camposeco and Heather Wilson, our executive director. If you will, again, please take a moment to make sure that your microphone is muted. And then if you will take a moment to toggle your video off during the conversation, that will allow us to have um, everything on view during the slideshow with Heather and Day. And then I invite you to turn your video back on at the end for our conversation and questions with Day. Please feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll make sure that we address those um, as well. So Heather and Day, I will turn it over to you and I'll keep an eye out for our um, other guests that may join us. And I was muted. Thank you, September. It's so wonderful to be here. I used to do these virtual conversations all the time during the pandemic. And you know, it fostered a surprising sense of community for us when we were all at home and some people have missed them. And so we're bringing them back. This talk about art series um, is going to be, a, you know, at least a few times a year, we'd like to do it and get folks together uh, so that we can talk about art from our homes um, with our uh, beverage of choice in hand. I've got some nice tea with me today. And uh, today I get to talk with Diana Camposeco, who is someone who I admire greatly. Um, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about Day. So Day's artwork reflects an abstract perspective of everyday life. Day was born in 1994 in Wilmington, right? In, in New Hanover Regional Medical Center. Is that right, Day? Um, yeah. She that, grew up in Bergal. Right. Um, she, we figured out uh, before we came on today that she was born the year I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Day will be graduating from Cape Fear Community College this following year and intends to pursue a digital arts degree at UNC Wilmington, which we're really excited to hear about that. We love working with the digital arts department at UNCW. As a millennial, Day was exposed to the digital world at a relatively young age. Their first camera was a flip phone. And as their interest for the medium grew, Dayana started upgrading cameras. They now shoot with a Nikon D5600. My husband is a filmmaker and he loves a Nikon too. Dayana's goal and vision is to celebrate diversity and highlight beauty while exploring themes of migration, systemic poverty and queerness. As a current queer Latinx photographer based in Wilmington, North Carolina, their current work focuses on intimate portraiture while exploring social, political, and cultural themes within traditionally underrepresented groups in the American South. Their works have been displayed in the Wilma W. Daniels Gallery, Fried Fruit Art Gallery, and the Cameron Art Museum for the State of the Art Exhibition. Campus Seco's current exhibition, Bring to Light, gives insight into the family of a visual artist, Dayana and Diego Campus Seco, filled with images that speak their thoughts on identity, pushing boundaries, and awaking politically powerful conversations. Dayana, welcome. I'm so honored to get to talk to you today. Um, so I wanted to ask you first a little bit about your, about your background. Day, your parents migrated to this country in the early 90s. Their journey to the United States um, was, was arduous, yet two of their children became artists. What about your family connected you to art or created that space for you and your brother to become artists? So I would say that my experience with the crops harvested in Pender County uh, that also include like tobacco, sweet potato and blueberries, they really ultimately gave me a different perspective, like the both of us, Diego and I included, um, to the understanding of these migrant experiences um, at such a, a young age. Uh, so it's just like a, a showcase of the cultural differences in in my life, in our life. 
Uh, we can actually move on to the next slide. Uh, you want to tell us about this slide? Yeah, so um, these are two images that Diego actually took. He graduated from UNC with a BFA in studio art. Uh, and um, I'm just going to pull that up on my screen. Uh, so he, he, in a way, or already kind of like used um, green. It's like a, a symbol in art as like money or uh, just life in general. Um, and he really... He really used his words with actions in, in photos and, and stuff like that. Um, in the photo on the left, you'll see two subjects wearing, or not, well, they are wearing uh, clothes, but they're also holding a watermelon. Um, and if you look above, you'll see uh, some watermelon candy. Uh, it's a type of Sour Patch Kids candy that uh, he kind of grew up with and kind of played a, um, a part in that. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that the photo on the left is actually a photo of my dad. Um, Diego, he scanned this image originally uh, and then created it with another scanned image, making it like a form of digital art. And uh, he, in the next image, he also shows and explores his, he explores, um, you know, identity and stuff like that using a Go Diego Go mask. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that juxtaposition? So Diego often chooses uh, to juxtapose pop culture references, right? So we've got that that really um, sweet, sour candy that I think probably all of us, like when I look at that photograph, I can like, taste it in my mouth, right? Um, juxtaposing that with with these men holding this, this watermelon, right? And then the juxtaposition of Diego from Diego Go um, with the realities of the migrant experience. Um, and Diego does this again and again in his work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it really has to do a lot with like our upbringing and our influences and just being around um, and having migrant seasonal farm worker parents uh, and just the the part of belonging to two different cultures in society one like Mexican American well one Mexican and then the other American and and things like that um, so if we go on to the next slide uh, we can see some images that I took and they really revolve around the Latino experience in church and, and stuff like that. Um, the image on the left is actually an image of a communion service. People are in line waiting to get their, their bread um, and the father is standing there, you know, feeding it by hand and you can see uh, a little girl standing in a dress she's wearing all white it kind of goes into theme with like the communion style and of and culture etc um, and then on the image on the right you'll see the same father these are different times in it, there's a difference in years I would say between these two images uh, and I would say homosexuality, um, really the, the Catholic, the Catholic church's stance on homosexuality, uh, you know, really made me feel rejected and, uh, faced with discrimination and things like that. But I, I don't want to highlight that I, because it's, it's a part of, you know, how I grew up and, 
I don't have hatred for like the church or anything like that. Um, and I think it's just another way of giving representation to these really underrepresented groups in our society. Beautifully said. Oh, tell us about these. And these are yours, right? Actually, no, these are images uh, that Diego created when he was at uh, UNC studying under Jeff, I believe his last name is Whetstone. Um, he's working, I think, in New York City right now. Um, but you can you can see a little bit of this magical realism in, in these photos. Uh, they are also black and white. Um, I guess he he was studying, you know, the difference and technique of what each photo needs to, you know, mean something. Uh, Diego was actually named after Diego Rivera. So he was really influenced by books and things like that. Um, so uh, learning, you know, that he had, he was a, a teacher assistant or teaching artist, uh, as I would say, um, to kids uh, was, you know, kind of like his need to create in a way. Um, he wanted to show people that, you know, it, we make the world and, and stuff like that. Um, I remember this time when uh, a rural uh, salesman, he, he was uh, like a traveling salesman, but in the rural part of the county of where I grew up in, um, he would uh, go around to like different houses and, and sell world encyclopedias and stuff like that. Uh, and my brother had to like convince my dad to you know invest in, in that in like our future and stuff like that um, to, to find more meaning in life, I guess. I could see Diego doing that. Um, mm -hmm. He was so, so beloved at Cameron Art Museum. Uh, and I had the opportunity to work with Diego when he did uh, an outreach project with me. He, um, I wrote a grant and we got funding to send him to Duplin County to work with some students there. And one of the things I was most impressed about uh, with Diego was how deeply committed he was uh, to teaching his students art history before they even got to pick up a camera. Uh, and I loved that about them. He wanted them to know about art. He wanted them um, to know what he knew um, about contemporary art and also about art history. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, I know you and Diego were very close um, you guys were two years apart. And, and I remember when we first started working with Diego, you would often come with him to Cameron Art Museum. Um, how has his art making influenced your process? And then I'd also like to know how, how is your work different? Yeah, so, um, I would say that his collection isn't that big, um, but the collection of his that I have, uh, I have it like spread out on my walls in my bedroom. Um, so it's always a constant reminder and, and, and stuff like that uh, to who he was as an artist. Uh, what was that second question? I'd actually like to do two other questions. How is your work similar and how is it different? So I would say it's similar in terms of our need to use uh, color. Like this is an example of him using black and white um, and oh no, we can we can stay on on this one. That's fine. Uh, so 
he got to learn from a lot of, you know, influential people at his time spent at UNC. And uh, he, uh, he kind of differs from me as an artist. Uh, I usually tend to, you know, really see objects and um, the environment. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that my brother was actually diagnosed with schizophrenia and he had like a, a battle, uh, like a three year long battle with it. Um, it's still <laughs> sometimes difficult for me to talk about. Uh, for instance, this, this moment right now, <laughs> uh, just, to... You're doing a great job, Dave. <laughs> uh, so September is Suicide Awareness Month. Um, I just want to, you know, say that sometimes the warning signs of suicide, uh, are really subtle, um, but recognizing, you know, those signs can really start a conversation. And uh, on the next slide, you can see an image from Diego's desktop. Uh, and of course, you know, looking at it, you might not know it, you might be shocked by all of the images and, and stuff like that. Um, but he knew exactly how he organized everything and, and stuff like that, uh, which I can't say I necessarily follow into those same paths. Um, my desktop is a lot more organized and, and things. Um, I have like folders. Um, I mean, of course he had new folders here and stuff, but he was working on a lot of different uh, things, mostly focusing on the Latino aspect of the American South, um, which is something that I tend to do with my artwork. If we go on to the next slide, this is an example of some of my work. Um, and you can see that we are still, you know, kind of, we, we still use color to express that life because a lot of times life is in color. Well, it actually is in color. Um, the image on the left is, an image that I took while I was waiting for my mom to get out of an operation. Um, so I would say that my art artistic process is really influenced on like family members and seeing everything day to day and connecting it uh, in series and, and stuff like that. Usually when I shoot in black and white, it's because I haven't completely figured out what I'm going to do with it yet. Um, and I'm still trying to like grasp what I'm working on. And until I do that, I won't really shoot in color. Um, That's really you'll see, interesting. You'll see a, a book um, on the table on the image of the, on the left. And that's actually a book from Gordon Parks. Uh, and he really influenced a lot of my artwork during that, that time in my life. Um, it's still like ongoing, uh, but the conditions are a little bit better, uh, you know, with the situation of my mom and, and stuff like that. Uh, so, I also look for like patterns in my artwork. Um, it's ultimately just, uh, we have a unique way of approaching art. Um, 
on the next slide. So this is a series that I was working on as a student at Cape Fear in like my, my first year. Um, ultimately what I was trying to achieve with this is that you can take a photograph anywhere. Um, it doesn't really matter where you are, you kind of make up the environment. Um, and here I use these subjects uh, in front of like a, a board that has these posters. And it was actually at a, a rock concert venue here in Wilmington. Um, I was really trying to like finish this assignment so I didn't put much thought into it. And I was also, you know, uh, <clears throat> looking at a lot of materials from different artists. And for a second, I thought that portraits might be something that I was interested in. Today, I'd love to ask you, I always like to ask people about their origins as an artist. When did you start to create art? Uh, what medium did you first start? creating art in and, and when did you start when did you pivot and make that that choice to start to think of yourself as an artist so Diego really influenced a lot in those early years um, I think that when we're young we're more open to different techniques and different styles of learning and stuff like that. And he actually bought me like a, a Holga uh, and a Diana F plus. He, he thought it was kind of interesting that I had people in school call me Diana, even though it's Diana um, and, and stuff like that. So it's just these, uh, these little things that eventually, you know, led on to uh, artwork when I was in high school. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. So these are images I took in 2013. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> they're, they're square. Um, it's kind of how the camera shoots uh, it's a film camera. They're both plastic cameras. Um, the Diana F plus doesn't really allow for a double exposure. Um, and I don't know if you can see the, the captions on the bottom. It just differentiates the different types of uh, cameras and what images they produce and, and stuff like that. Um, so that, that influence was always there, uh, especially at an early age when I had these plastic cameras and uh, th that flip phone. Um, and it kind of, it kind of, my interest, it, uh, my interest wasn't as high as Diego's. He was trying to pursue a career in, in art and stuff like that. So I, I didn't take it seriously. Um, it wasn't until 2015 um, that I was working at a blueberry processing plant and I was exposed to a lot of uh, different people um, mostly Latino workers. And we used to work really long hours, sometimes like 12 to 13 hours, um, including cleanup just to get it uh, and ready and prepared for the next day. Uh, so here are some images that I took from 2015 to 2020. Uh, the first row is at this blueberry 
processing plant. And the second row of images is my time spent at working at a pigskin factory. Um, and there's kind of like a transition. I, uh, I had that job for a while uh, and I still had it even after Diego passed away. So kind of seeing that transition of like not really having kind of just like becoming distant from individuals from losing a life and, and a life of a loved one. Uh, and I really kind of like focused on, on me. Plus, because you were working in a production factory, you weren't really allowed to carry around a, a camera. Um, and before this, I was introduced to a book called Eating Animals. And it kind of just shed some light on the whole investigative part of uh, the meat processing factories and industry and stuff like that. Um, so exposure to all of this and just having that sense of needing to express and create um, really, really uh, played a part. Uh, on the next slide. Hey, can I just ask you a question? You're doing yes. an incredible job um, answering the question that I had about what compels you to create and what is the story that you want to tell. And so that last slide just made me want to ask this question. Do you, you know, I, I think about um, how Rosalia Torres Weiner um, told, tells us that she thinks of herself as an activist, you know, like an activist who's an activist through her, her art. Do you feel that way when you're in the process of telling this story? So I would definitely say I feel that way now. Uh, I didn't really feel that way in 2015. I was still trying to get my confidence and, and stuff like that. And the iPhone images that you see on the screen are actually something from like <laughs> way back in the iCloud. Uh, Very incredible. <laughs> you, never... you consciously think about, are you consciously trying to narrate a Latinx experience for your viewer? Are, are you, is that, is that part of the story that you're trying to articulate? Well, I don't think it's just necessarily like just Latino people. It, it's also all uh, individuals. Um, they're, it's kind of just like standing up for the underdog in society and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, in the next set of, or on the next slide, you can see how I explored street art. Um, this was after the 2020 incident um, and death of George Floyd, uh, where I really kind of started focusing on more of like the activist um, aspect, like Rosalia. Uh, I was working in Wilmington. I left the processing plants and I was working in Wilmington. Um, my job was downtown and uh, I was exposed to a lot of stuff while I was, you know, just walking. Um, mostly the street art, um, people were in protest uh, and it, you know, it kind of just caught my attention. They were in protest of all of the Civil War monuments that were located uh, in Wilmington, downtown Wilmington, and how they ultimately just looking at them just really made people upset um, to the point where if we get to the next slide, and can I just say something, Day? These are fierce. That last slide, these are fierce. And I'm seeing this progression in your work 
Um, that's so gratifying to see. And, and I hope that you can see it too, how your work is, is growing and changing as you grow and change and mature as an artist. And it's just, it's really compelling. And this isn't a question other than just to compliment you on your work. It's really exciting to see. I do have one question there. <laughs> what, what do you want the viewers to take away from your art? Um, what do you want you know, people like me or September or Barbara or Yolanda or Esther or Lori who are here, um, I see, you know, there's a lot of people um, that we know from the community. There's probably some folks that we don't know. What do you want people to take away when they, they look at one of your photographs? Um, what do you want them to experience? Well, I, I take a lot of different types of photos. Um, I, I do some documentary style. I also um, explore different avenues. Um, here in this image, you'll see some people standing in a hallway. And that was actually uh, right after um, or during a trial of someone who was arrested during the protest here in, in Wilmington um, over these uh, said Civil War monuments. And if we go on to the next slide, I can better also better explain. Yeah. Uh, so the concept of the flea market was, it was inspired by these set of photos. I was shooting a fisheye and uh, because I was working uh, at the processing plant, and this kind of is like a little bit back into the future, it's in 2020, um, because I was spending so much time and and stuff like that with my mom because she was sick. Uh, this is a, a flea market that takes place on Thursdays and Saturdays. Uh, and you can't really see the images too well. Um, I, I, it's not a very good camera, uh, but on the next set of images, you can kind of see where I'm, you know, exploring different avenues. Similar to themes of like BDSM. This was in a blueberry field out in Rocky Point. And because I had so much access and I created, you know, friendships with my subjects, I was able to interact with them on a more intimate level. And I, <laughs> I really have to say that this was inspired by that film, Brokeback Mountain. <laughs> um, here we have a, a subject wearing masks and it's just, you know, that longing for identity, especially um, being queer in the South um, and belonging to different cultures yeah, the longing for identity. Um, we talked a little bit, but not a whole lot about mask before this started. Um, and I didn't let you finish your thought. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the mask that you're using and why you're choosing to use them in these works, but also um, about other masks that you've used. I mean, the, in the previous photo, of course, it was because of the pandemic folks were wearing masks, but I think there's something to be said there. Yeah, so, I mean, masks, you're, you're really able to hide behind a mask. Um, a lot of people aren't willing to take a photo uh, if they're not wearing a mask and doing all sorts of different things. Um, for example, the things in, in these photos. Uh, and I don't know, I, I guess I would say that it just, it catches my attention. 
um, really how we can create works as artists um, that don't really, you know, if you don't look too much into it, it's just like, it could really mean anything to its viewers. Uh, and I just wanna like keep it open to interpretation uh, per se in, in this. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love it when you laugh like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm really nervous. <laughs> You're doing a great job. We are so proud of you. So what's happening here? What are we looking at? Uh, so these are actually like snippets um, from a, a larger video. Uh, so Diego really influenced a lot of my work, um, but I also influenced him. In, in other ways, like it was my idea to get that painting in the background of the photo. And that's an image of the desert. On the next image, you can notice like, oh no, on like, I meant like on the- So on was the this side, a photograph that Diego took? So the the image on the, on the right yeah. is, a snippet, like it's an image, a still form, a still photo of a, a larger video that's like eight minutes. And it's a person just running on a treadmill, but having, you know, those pictures on the background kind of resemble the experience of crossing, you know, the border and um, ultimately settling in North Carolina, a place where we have uh, lighthouses. And that is actually a print from, I believe, Ivy Hayes. Uh, are you, is anyone familiar with Ivy Hayes? He was, uh, he was uh, uh, a screen printer, um, among other things here in the area. Yeah. And painter. He was also a painter. I actually own one of his, his prints. Um, and then that print is from my parents' house. Because uh, he also, my dad owns one of one of his um, prints because my dad worked on his air conditioning and, and stuff like that. So we, it's really just like tying in all of our connections into these photos and uh, our independent um, experiences uh, and stuff like that. Uh, the image on the left is something that I created. Uh, while I was dealing with the death of my brother. And um, I actually submitted this into the student art show at Cape Fear in uh, like 2021 or something like that. And in one second place, um, the colors that of clothing that the subject is wearing is supposed to resemble, you know, Mexico, the Mexican flag and, and stuff like that. Um, so I guess you could say my artwork does also uh, gravitate towards word um, Latino issues and, and stuff. I love this one. So this one was in state of the art, art of the state. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about it? So I titled this flea market number two um, by this Point, I was already filming uh, or taking photos on my camera, my Nikon, uh, and I was able to produce really, you know, interesting content. Uh, my experience with the flea market already, uh, you know, created these relationships with the vendors where they were more comfortable with me. Um, and of course, they were sometimes very specific um, like, for example, they didn't want their face or anything, you know, that could, that someone could use against them because a lot of the times the, the vendors are um, migrant um, people who, you know, came to this world looking for a better life. Um, so they, they have a tendency to, you know, slide under the cracks and, and stuff like that in society. Um, by choosing to be anonymous and 
you know, not really uh, existing. Um, but here you can see some nopales. Uh, and these are actually used um, for eating. You can mix them with egg and they make, you know, really delicious breakfast foods um, that you can put into sandwiches. Uh, and you might think, why would someone eat a, a cactus? Uh, so Mexico has a lot of vegetation. Um, of course, the country in some areas is really, really poor, um, but there's you know, large farming grounds and stuff like that. And they make a lot of their uh, money off of harvesting crops, a lot like here in the American South. Um, so this was kind of like <sighs> me forming um, a series on my own before it became bring to light and I tied in, you know, all of my brother's artwork. This was, you know, still something that belong to me. Um, I love that. And also connects to the theme of identity. Oh, you got to tell us about this one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had really good um, teachers. Uh, Dr. Mace and uh, Ben Billingsley, along with um, Topher Alexander, he, uh, they, well, they all kind of, you know, gave me the confidence to explore different aspects, um, also pertaining to like art history and, and stuff like that. Uh, the image on the left is a painting. Um, by the artist Cassius Marcellus Coolidge. And at the time they, well, for the artist, they ended up using it on like advertisements and, and stuff like that. Um, but I really related to it because um, I had a, a dog growing up, it was a Chihuahua. And, uh, you know, it, it really made me feel a sense of love um, before, you know, romantic love and, and stuff like that. It's kind of like the ideology behind the United States and, and stuff like that with uh, TV series and, and different movies um, where they represent the dog as like man's best friend. Uh, and I, I didn't know until I was making this PowerPoint that this is actually called uh, a friend in need. Um, and the photo on the right is an image that I took with some friends. Um, we're still using that, you know, mask, dog mask and concealing yourself. Um, and then you have two dogs uh, the story behind this is a little sad. Uh, Wednesday, which is the German Shepherd on the left side of the image, um, she was actually diagnosed with cancer and she passed away or she didn't pass away, but she had to be put down, um, you know, because she was in a lot of pain and stuff like that. And my friend, you know, she kind of really grew up with this dog and it uh, in a way influenced, um, you know, how she lived her life and, and stuff like that. And she's a really big dog person. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted something that I could, you know, mess around with and play. And I was just looking for different ideas. Um, and this thought came to mind. Um, the dogs are actually playing card games. Um, uh, they're not holding anything, but it's on like the table and, and stuff like that. <laughs> I love it. I love the playfulness. I love it. And there's lots of layers there. So Day, you have an exhibition now. Oh, but let's talk about this first. So this is another evolution uh, in your work. What's going on on these slides? Yeah, so 
Um, this is kind of like what I'm working on right now. I'm doing a lot of documentary style photography um, and that, you know, coincides with like going to community events like um, the board meetings and, uh, you know, just hearing what people have to say and what the community has to say. Uh, this was an image, well, the majority of these images were taken on the same day. And uh, it wasn't the day that they officially temporarily banned the book, stamped, um, but it was under discussion. And a lot of members from the community actually came to, um, you know, show their support and ultimately uh, just say, share their, their view on why books shouldn't be mon monitored by uh, the county and, you know, kids can ultimately choose to, to read books, especially from the aspect of the marginalized groups in our history. Um, and what the book is actually about and the whole journey and stuff like that. It's limiting our youth. Um, so I, I try to partake in, in things like that and just create a series of the journeys. Sometimes it, it takes days and, and weeks and sometimes years. Um, but this is just something I'm working on with current events. These are wonderful. I love that you have three other employees from Cameron Art Museum in that bottom left-hand picture. <laughs> ah, so tell us about your influences. Uh, Gordon Parks is a really big influence on, you know, my my artwork and photos because I've looked at his books and I was able to learn a lot of things from these books because you're actually able to physically hold them and turn the pages and everything like that. Something that you're not able to do uh, with an image on a computer. Um, but I, in, in Gordon Park's works, you can actually sense like that uh, engagement with community and, and how his work ultimately reflected the times and that's how I'm trying to use my artwork but also uh, you know using funny funny uh representations like for example that photo on the right of Gordon Parks it's supposed to be the image of the couple holding the pitchfork I can't remember what it's called right now but it's just um you know, some of my influences. Uh, another influence of mine is Luciela. She's a Mexican photographer and she explores identity along with, um, you know, objects and subjects and subject matter, the environment. Um, she was more of like a, a black and white photographer uh, and something that I learned with black and white it's you have to you can't have a photo that is too overwhelming um, either you have to concentrate on the, the subject and have like a, a bland background um, as you can see some of these backgrounds aren't bland um, they're actually interesting to look at. Um, these are just some things that she explored while she was spending times in different communities uh, in Mexico and stuff like that. Incredible. So Day, you have an exhibition uh, right now in Studio One at Cameron Art Museum with, um, with Diego's work um, that if you haven't anyone who's here if you haven't been to the museum yet to see bring to the light it's so beautiful and it's a wonderful exhibition what has that experience been like for you um to be a part of that and to be a part of part of that with your brother 
It's really been an interesting ride. Um, I still get some people who visit the museum and working their visitor services. I definitely get that um, interaction and they're able to share things with me that I, you know, honestly never even considered in one of his photos and stuff like that. And, and sometimes, you know, some of these people actually knew him and they're able to somehow kind of like bring him back um, into, you know, who I am. Uh, the whole exhibition is still relatively new to me. Um, I'm trying to talk about really complex issues. For example, that exhibition really focuses on uh, the Starway flea market and vendors um, and the other side of the photos by Diego are just things that were part of his collection when he passed away, um, focusing on, you know, an individual, Geraldo, uh, to be specific, and his connection to the American um, South and identity, things like that. Um, so I really hope that this exhibition really, you know, touches and influences our community members um, because it also in a way is about like the stigma in uh, um, mental health within the Latino community and, and stuff like that. Um, and just, you know, adjusting and, and things like that. But it, overall, it's been a really good experience. A lot of people at CAM have been very welcoming and, and just ultimately incredible uh, to like the growth of me as an artist. And it's really interesting to work with them and stuff like that. It's absolutely been our honor. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I think Cameron Art Museum really uh, came into contact with Diego's work through an exhibition that he was in at the Nasher Museum um, at Duke uh, called Southern Accents. And after that exhibition, we were able to acquire, say you probably know, uh, three of his work, three of his works. I think we own three. Um, they're beautiful works. Um, and his work is also owned by other institutions. Do you know what other institutions have Diego's work in their collection? Nasher Museum. Uh, it's associated with Duke University um, in the Tri-City. And Diego wrote um, a beautiful essay. It was a short essay for that the Southern Accents catalog at the Nasher. That was really lovely um, and very important. Uh, a very important short essay about uh, being Latinx in the American South. Uh, it was an important aspect of that exhibition. Um, so if you haven't come to CAM, please do come see Day's work. Um, also come see Place of Encounters and our other exhibition, Love. So I think we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, and I see that Nan has a question. I can go ahead and read it to you, Day. Uh, Day, your photos allow for some interesting conversation between two Bergolf teenagers' family that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Thank you for that. It wasn't a question, just a comment. Um, if you have a question, you are welcome to unmute yourself and go ahead and turn your video back on um, and ask a question of Day. Or if you want to say hello, I'm sure she'd love to see your face. Uh, Jamie Scott, I'm glad you're here, Jamie. Jamie says, I remember seeing Diego's work at the Nasher. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> I'm just saying uh, hello. Fritzy. Can <laughs> you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm just saying hello. And I, I wanted to, uh, as I'm looking at, both of their works. I'm seeing Day as, tell me if I'm wrong, and it's interesting that you just revealed that your brother had uh, a problem with schizophrenia. He shows 
two sides of things pretty consistently. I'm thinking of the quinceanera with the gown in the warehouse and standing in the midst of a tobacco field with that mask on. It's like uh, not tragedy and comedy, but something akin to that. I, I feel that in his work a lot. And yours, I feel that it's more of a visually poetic documentation. It's a little more straightforward, um, but beautifully done, uh, whether it's black and white or color. And I think that you you part in that way. You see the beauty in just what's before you and present without having to uh, skew that. And I love his work too, but I think that skewing that he does is not something that you do. You just enhance the beautiful aspects yeah. of what seem to be a very common situation. Fritzi, that was so beautifully said. I know I feel that in your work too, Day. Your work is so grounded um, in a way at which maybe Diego's isn't, but I love them both. Just like Fritzi said, that, yeah. that magical realism in Diego's work, that those juxtapositions are so interesting, but then there's something very deep and spiritual, um, but also just um, very present in your work as well. Yeah, thank you, um, both of you. Really like that, you know, visually poetic aspect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <sighs> yeah, it's it's kind of hard being a, a student and like an artist at the same time. You kind of have to like choose which one to focus on in different moments mm -hmm. um, where you have to prioritize. Um, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm trying. <laughs> Day at one point, there was a question in the chat uh, from Meg saying, how do you know when to capture the scene? How does it speak to you? That's a really good question. Um, so I think it would have to do with some of my time spent working in the production um, plants. Uh, I was doing, you know, regular daily activities. I was like a quality assurance um, tech and I was grading different types of um, vegetation like blueberries and, and uh, sweet potatoes. So like attention to detail was really important at that time. And you can see a lot of different interesting things in vegetation. Um, you know, there's times where it's really, really gross and just like completely rotten, but it like the very beauty of it being rotten and, and stuff like that. If you take a photo of it, it could, you know, really mean something else to someone else and takes them back to something like that. So I would say just a lot of my experiences and I, I try to take my camera everywhere because you never know uh, what's going to happen. Um, especially with like the news and being where you at and where you're at in a specific moment and yeah <laughs> I hope that answered your question thank you thank you I think Jenna may have a question. I, or I, Andy, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a part in your slide where you were talking about the work that you used to do and the cameras that you used to use. Would you ever experiment with those cameras again with the new style of art that you're currently making now? I, I would I would probably most likely explore that that um 
that theme. Uh, however, I don't know if I would really like use those cameras for something like that because they're plastic cameras and they're like cheaply made. Um, they're not really meant to compete with uh, technology nowadays. Uh, so I wanted to spread some news about the next community day. It's uh, going to be September 24th, day after the Latino festival. And uh, it's going to be free admission for everyone. <laughs> you guys are Can still you be working free. that day, Dave? <laughs> You know, are you working visitor services that day? Yeah, yeah, I I um I am. I'm really excited to see the Azteca dancers. Yeah. I've, I've seen uh the video in Rodrigo's room. It's just breathtaking. And I'm I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready with my oh, camera. Come on, Sunday, September 24th, and you can see day and see the Azteca dancers and experience the exhibition and all kinds of good stuff. And I'm gonna jump in with a quick question for Day. Um, I'm looking at your work, which is outstanding. I, I totally agree with Heather that you're bold um, in your new work. I have a question. Are, have you found you're in school and you're being given assignments? Have you gone back and found personal work to fulfill those assignments? Or have you just gone out and done the assignment that you were given? So, wait, does um, she have professors on here? Maybe she shouldn't answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> she, you could pull from personal work. <laughs> Yeah, so I it I guess it really depends on what the assignment is. Usually I like to keep like a private collection because it's an ongoing collection and I don't really want to like share too much into it um, just because it's like my experience and it's also very personal to me um, and stuff like that. Uh, so... At this point in my, you know, photography career, it's really just easy to finding or to find a subject that, you know, really sparks an interest in, in me and my perception of the life. Um, so I usually try to create new content just because it kind of keeps you on your toes. Um. <laughs> Sure, sure. It's usually posed around a subject or something, though, or a technique where will you someday show some of your more personal work? Do you have an aspiration to do that? Yeah, yeah, I really do. Um, I've been studying a lot of uh, different artists and they use books as a form to like for like monetary gain and, and stuff like that. Um, so th I'm definitely interested in that aspect because it's kind of like keeping up with the times and, you know, of course I'm like studying science at the moment, but I'm also gonna go to UNCW and do some like digital art and probably incorporate apps into that. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll probably be in a book. Um, something like that, that, you know, won't be very expensive and helps, you know, other artists like me grow and exist. Wonderful. When you do the Kickstarter for that book, I hope you let us all know. <laughs> we'll support you. Okay, thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. you got 27 people who are ready to support you already. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and I know that Jean also offered a question in the chat. 
Um, he's saying that I think your trajectory is so interesting. How many of the jobs you've gotten throughout your life um, have you partaken solely with the purpose of finding artistic inspiration and what inspired you about them? So, I, I'm interested in going to different places and traveling. I haven't done a lot of traveling. Um, and I feel like if I travel, I'll be able to see the world in an even bigger lens. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that photographers in a way are explorers. Um, and when they take an image, they're using that to, to document a special moment or in life or, or something along those lines. Uh, so because photos are so important to me and not being able to have photos of Diego anymore, like I have a collection of his, but I won't get any like new photos. I, uh, I really value, you know, subjects and and what their existence in our life kind of mean in a way if that <laughs> if that answers the question to john thank you day yeah mm -hmm. and thank you for the question john I certainly want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a pleasure to hear from you, Day. Thank you so much, Heather, for the beautiful questions that you um, had for Day. And, and certainly, I hope that all of you have had an opportunity to come through the exhibition. Um, and if not, uh, please be sure to come to the museum anytime Monday through Tuesday. Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to five. And then of course on Thursday nights, we're open late. Um, and as mentioned, we have a community day coming up in just a few weekends away on the 24th when the museum is open for everyone in the community, free to all, um, an opportunity to see day's exhibition as well as place of encounters and love. Um, and then the dancers that will be on the grounds at two o'clock. So I hope that we are able to see many of you at the museum in person. Thank you all for joining and hearing me talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank everyone. you so much. Good night. Thank you. Bye.